Hi, I'm David Harmon, and this is my partner, Keith Cook. We are real estate brokers with Remax in Bellingham, Washington. Yeah, we hope you like our series. We've got a variety of uh, information here on YouTube. We've got a real estate homes for sale section. We've got uh, all about Bellingham, Whatcom County section with all the neighborhoods and points of interest, parks, all that stuff. We also have an educational series and that's what this is part of the real estate terms and lingo. On our website, a lot of people were searching real estate terms. So this video specifically, this series will be for real estate glossary or lingo or terms that realtors or brokers are using in real estate. So hopefully you like it. We are brokers. The end result is what we're hoping for is that people like what we have to say. They want to list their property for sale or help us help them find a property to buy. So check it out, like, subscribe, and hope you enjoy. Hey Keith, a lot of people want to know what a 1031 exchange is. And I know just enough to be dangerous, not all the way, but it's, it's definitely more kind of an accounting question or a 1031 facilitator question. But the gist of it is um, taxing. So if you sell your primary residence, you're taxed different than selling an investment property. So your primary residence, you can sell every two years and make $250,000 profit per person. So a single 250, if you're a couple, $500,000. As long as, and there's some other rules with that too, as far as uh, if you're considered a dealer or that's all you do is, is real estate, that's separate. But let's say that you bought an investment property 10 years ago and you wanted to trade it for another property. Um, the process with that is the IRC, Internal Revenue Code 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange. And essentially what happens is that you have, from the date of closing, you have 180 days to purchase your replacement property. And you could trade anything like if you sold a rental house, you could trade that for a duplex or a fourplex or vacant land or a condo, as long as it's in the United States. Um, there's requirements with it where you have to identify it within 45 days. It's a little complicated. Ask us and we'll give you uh, more insight on that. But it's a pretty good tax savings because had someone just sold that property after 10 years, say they made a $200,000 gain, they're gonna have to pay taxes on that whole 200,000. The benefit is by trading it, any taxes that you would have owed now move into the new property. And so you kind of get use of what you would have paid in taxes. So saving money, it's a pretty good deal. Okay, Dave, here's another one for you. What is acceptance? Acceptance is agreeing to the terms of an offer where the two parties um, are mutually agreed upon. I like it. Okay, this one comes up quite often as far as measurements of land, um, as far as what you're gonna get on buying something. So usually we measure them in an acre, and what is an acre? An acre is an area of land equaling 43,560 square feet. Right, yep. And then sometimes they're gonna be smaller, so you can get a half acre, a quarter acre, or 10 acres, so you can get a variety of sizes, but that's the yeah. basic measurement of an acre. Or 4,840 square yards. Oh, didn't know that one. Hey, hey, hey. There, how many yards? 4,840. Huh, all right. Double check that at home, but well, I, I'm gonna take your word for it. <laughs> A federal law requiring facilities that are open to the public to ensure accessibility to disabled persons, even if that access requires making architectural modifications. So the ADA also requires employers to make reasonable accommodations for disabled employees. Usually we're going to run into that in real estate more on new construction or when people are going to um, have a commercial property. So a new construction, if you're going to say build uh, uh, condominiums, there's going to be a certain percentage depending on your jurisdiction 
um, how many units have to be designed with uh, wheelchairs in mind. So those will have uh, lower cabinets, um, lower sinks, kind of more set up for tow kick so you can actually move uh, wheelchairs around, uh, wider um, hallways, bathrooms. Just kind of you see commercially with ADAs where they're uh, wider with grab bars and stuff like that, first floor. So it's a pretty cool, um, pretty cool setup, I think, and, and um, it's a nice requirement to have for people who are uh, disabled. An adjustable rate mortgage or an ARM, a loan in which interest rate is periodically increased or decreased to reflect the changes of the current cost of money. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's, it definitely can fluctuate. I think my theory on adjustable rate mortgages is something that you would maybe get if you're going to hold a property for a short period of time. Depending on where you think interest rates are forecasted to go in the future, if you believe they're on the upward bound, you might be better off to lock in your interest rate right now because you can lock it for you know, 10, 20, 30 years and have the guarantee the entire time that the rate will not, will not change. If you believe the interest rates are going lower, then you might like an adjustable rate mortgage because your rate will go down in time as well. Uh, there's a risk either way you, you look at it. Um, it, it, it. You have to work what works best for you and your family. Um, the one benefit is initially adjustable rate mortgages start lower than fixed rate mortgages. So initially right off the bat, you're gonna have a little bit lower interest rate. Adverse possession is um, a term that gets thrown around a few times, but actually I don't really see it come into play that much recently. What it is, there's requirements. Um, it's basically if there's a property owner, two property owners, and one property owner takes property from the neighbor. And what that's happened, I think there's some requirements. It has to be open, hostile, notorious. Um, and it has to be, there's a time frame, either seven or 10 years, depending on what type of adverse possession. But essentially, if you put your f fence on your neighbor's property for 10 years, mowed the lawn, looked like you paid the taxes and you're using it, you would have a claim for adverse possession saying, I've used it for 10 years, therefore now it's mine. You can't do that with government property, so you can't just go move into a park, put a fence around it and say, I've been here for 10 years. You, you can't take the, any government property, but they will let individuals take property from each other. Normally where I've seen adverse possession come in is on larger tracts of land. After there's a survey, you'll see that there's a second, there's a survey line showing what the, what the deed shows what the property is. And then there's a second little mark on there showing like where a fence line is. And those can be up for, up for debate. They're kind of a hassle and it's not our area of expertise. That's something the title company or an attorney would help you figure out, but it is out there. All right, Dave, um, I hear the term thrown around amortize or amortization. How does that fall into real estate? It's, it's generally the gradual payoff of a debt and installment payments that include the principal and interest. So your lender will mostly help you figure this out depending on your down payment and your interest rate. You'll figure out your loan. It's, it's generally the buyer's choice if they want to do a 15 year loan or a 30 year loan. Sometimes uh, 15 year loans are lower. Um, your payment's gonna be higher, but by making higher payments, you've paid the, the home off in 15 years versus 30 years. So if you haven't bought a home before, it's kind of like a credit card payment. The, the faster you pay, the, the quicker the, the car's yours. An appraisal is a written report usually done by an appraiser giving you what is considered to be the current market value of a property. Generally, the appraisal would be done um, for a bank, uh, for your mortgage company, to help protect uh, their interest in your property. But generally, appraisal is just given the value of what the property is worth. Okay, Dave, uh, what is an annual percentage rate? Well, the APR is the actual cost that you pay for a loan. So it actually wraps up everything that you are getting in your loan. So it, in, it would include uh, points, um, any dock fees, um, appraisal fees, uh, mm -hmm. discount points, uh, any, anything that's, it's all wrapped together um, in a neat little package that uh, encompasses the entire 
loan costs. Right, so even if it said like, if you're getting a 5% interest rate, by the time you calculate in appraisals, loan fees, dog prep, whatever all these fees are, it went from five to five and a quarter or something. It just went up uh, an amount. So that's the actual amount that you're paying for the whole loan. Which is good to know because it can make a big difference if you have a, bu a strict budget and you're not calculating in all the other fees that the uh, lender may charge you. And I think it's a true way to find out what the lender is really charging and not that. I like our local lenders. There's a lot of online lenders that I haven't met before, but sometimes someone may tease you and say, all right, you're getting a 4% interest rate, but they're gonna charge so much in fees, the actual APR is 4.75 where a local lender may say it's 4% and the APR is really four and a quarter because they're not charging all these extra fees. So all the extra fees and all the extra costs are what's an added onto the interest rate to actually get the actual interest rate. So it's a good number to know. Yeah, if you're searching for a loan, make sure you ask for the, the APR um, and because that's gonna actually help you get to the finish line a little bit easier. Yeah, and you'll truly know what you're getting. Hey Keith, what is an assignment? In real estate, I think the technical term would be an assignment of one party's interest in an agreement to another party's interest. We'll see it a lot in investment um, where it may say, you know, Dave Harmon and or assigns. And basically what I run into with this is that you've got a contract that's signed uh, mutual acceptance, and you're not sure um, if you're gonna maybe add a partner or put it into an LLC name, or potentially uh, back all the way out of it and then find a new party to assign it to. So the way I've seen assignments work is you have the contract and or assigns, you find another party who is willing to, um, a lot of times pay for your position to be in that contract. So I could say, hey Dave, I'll give you a thousand bucks and you assign me the contract. So I give you a thousand bucks and then you assign the contract to me and then I close as if I was you as the same terms of the agreement. So it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good backup plan if you if the buyer's putting a lot of energy in, into uh, um, exploring and doing feasibility on a property and, and want to make sure to cover their basis so they know that they don't want to spend thousands of dollars researching a property and then it doesn't work for them and then they decide to change their mind. So at least they can recapture their money having that assignment. Because without an assignment written into the contract, you can't do that. So that has to be included in the contract with your ability to assign to a third party. An offer that is contingent on the failure of an existing sale to close. When a seller accepts a backup offer, the buyer will be able to purchase the property if the first transaction falls through. So Dave, practically, um, how does a backup offer work in the real estate world? A backup offer is an, is an accepted offer that is contingent on the first offer failing. So if you have um, offer A, which has been accepted, if they fail on theirs, then the backup offer B would move into that first position. So it, it's a good deal for somebody because the house would not go back on the market. It would automatically get um, moved up to be in first position. So. Um, it's a good it's a good opportunity in a seller's market when there's a lot of competing offers. It can move you to the first position without uh, having the, the house go back on the market. Yeah, and I agree. And I, the nice thing with the seller, if you have a backup offer, it is um, a little bit more challenging for the first offer that's accepted to negotiate repairs or terms if they're a known backup offer. There's some strategies. Sometimes the backup offer may try to be higher than the accepted offer, so the seller has incentive to try to go with the backup offer. Um, and it's a benefit for the buyer because they know if for any reason something happens with that first sale, they're right back in first place and not potentially in a multiple uh, offer or competing situation for that property. Balloon mortgage. A partially amortized mortgage loan that requires a large balloon payment at the end of the loan term. We'll see these most often with owner contract financing or more in commercial when the loan is actually due. So the general idea of, of a loan is that you will start a loan 
do an amortization schedule. So assuming that you have a fixed rate mortgage, you'll come up with, uh, say, 30 years of fixed monthly payments. And at the end of the 30 years, you've paid the property off free and clear. Um, and it kind of goes, each of your payments, some goes towards principal, some goes towards interest. And each year as you go and each month as you go, a little bit more is going towards principal because the, the uh, balance is going down and, and you're tr being charged less interest on a, uh, a smaller amount. What the balloon happens and with owner contracts, someone may say, we'll sell you the property, we'll do an amortization for 30 years, but I want all my money in five years. I don't want to wait 30 years for the money. So we want a balloon payment in five years. Or maybe we want a partial balloon payment. We want an annual partial balloon payment so the buyer pays a little bit more principal each month or each time that that is reoccurring. Loan, loans with balloon payments can be tricky. Um, we're happy to help out and uh, guide you through that if it's an option that you're kind of thinking about. Um, your lender can definitely be a great asset in that as well, but um, there's definitely some things to think over before you jump into a loan that would have a balloon payment. And it, usually the easy out for a balloon payment is at the end of the term when the balloon payment is due, either you sell the property to pay off the balloon payment or you refinance the property to pay the mortgage off and the balloon payment or you just pay the difference if you have the cash available then you just pay the balloon payment off. So it's a good way to get into property that will um, may not have no normally readily been available if, if the lender or, or seller requires a balloon payment. A bump clause is it's a provision in the purchase and sale agreement that technically allows the seller to keep his house on the market um, during the period of time where there is a contingent sale. So the bump clause uh, comes into effect if they get another offer on the property, they can go back to the original offer and say that they have to perform perform within a certain period of time or remove that contingency, whatever that may be. So it's basically possibly bumping that first offer out of the way to allow the second offer a chance to purchase the, the property. The purchase, sale, exchange, or lease of a business or businesses, goodwill, inventory, or other assets. Generally, agents involved in business opportunity transactions that include real estate need to be a real estate licensee. And so we'll do a lot of sales with like it's the business, like we're selling a gas station right now. So if someone wants to buy the real estate and the, uh, the business we're selling right now, and that one's gonna be an owner operator. We've got a pizza place for sale right now, and someone's gonna buy that one and just buy it as an investment. They might wanna do something with it later. The, the real business opportunity may be if you have a business and you don't um, own the real estate. So you're leasing the real estate and you have a business. And for some reason, they put a lot of these businesses into working with real estate brokers. So it's a, a definitely a little niche, a little market, but if you had a, um, a sandwich shop and you were renting from someone and you wanted to sell it, a lot of people hire a broker with their marketing and advertising to go through and help you sell your business. So it's a little different, but that would be the business opportunity, a business that does not typically have the real estate. Sometimes it may be something like the gas station or the pizza shop where you own the real estate and the business and then that's possible as well. Capital gain, that's a, that's a pretty broad category, but it's generally the, the profit that you make from selling a capital asset. In real estate, uh, it'd be selling a piece of property um, that you have uh, generally a, a lot of equity in and you're gonna uh, make a profit up. And in a house, that can be different because you have some exemptions um, and in investment properties, there's other parameters involved as well. Right. And one thing too with it it's really complicated but do you feel you might have any inside track with any capital gains because I, of any tax situations i would say that the biggest thing with capital gains would be to uh, consult with a cpa and get uh, that knowledge from that individual because we are not tax experts true that 
It's a declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions, often recorded by a developer to place restrictions on all lots within a new subdivision. Practically where we may see it is, um, you may have a board that wants to approve things or uh, like you can't paint your house a certain color or there's just restrictions on a property. You can't have your fence so high. Um, you can't uh, park your RV out front. Um, How about chickens? Chickens? I like chicken. <laughs> Some CCRs don't like chicken. So <laughs> no animals, poultry, farms. Um, it's just rules for your neighborhood. That's really what it comes down to. A document issued by the Department of Veterans Affairs as evidence of a veteran's eligibility for a VA guaranteed loan. If you were in the military, you're gonna know if you could qualify for a VA loan or not. I was in the military, I've used mine three times. It's probably, in my opinion, the best loan out there because you can come in with no money down and buy a house. So it's, it's an awesome loan. If you've used it, I've used mine a few times and the more I've used it, um, I've had to um, pay uh, a little bit more in fees and stuff, but it's it's a great loan. I think it's the best loan out there In real estate, what is the closing statement? The closing statement is generally prepared by the escrow Officer and it's a detailed accounting of all the funds involved in a transaction So from a seller standpoint, it would take your purchase price list all of your closing costs title, escrow, excise tax, uh, brokerage fees, your mortgage, and you would end up with an accounting of all the numbers that it took to get to your um, to your net proceeds. From the buyer standpoint, it would be all of your costs associated with getting the loan. If you're getting a loan, um, taxes, your closing costs with uh, escrow and title. And it would be an accounting of where all financially you found yourself in the transaction. Closing, what is closing in a real estate transaction? Closing is once we've gone through the listing, gone through the whole buying process, made it all the way, got the loan documents ready, and we actually get a date on when it closes. So we go to escrow and sign all the papers, and it's actually the date it's recorded and funded. So the seller will um, sign the deed over to the buyer, the buyer comes up with the cash, and uh, usually buyer's gonna get some keys, and that's closing. And that's nice, that's when we've actually completed our, our job. It's been a long process, but we're, uh, we're excited. Closing is uh, the best part of real estate. CMA or competitive market analysis, I've heard it, comparative market analysis. What, what does that do? And that's essentially when a property owner will contact a broker and ask them to prepare their opinion of value for a specific property. So in some ways it's a short or abbreviated appraisal for a property for uh, either for sale or, or for refinance or someone just curious the value of what that real estate may be. Brokers are happy to prepare those for you. Okay, this has got to make my top 10 list of favorite real estate terms. What is commission? Commission is the compensation that a real estate broker receives after they complete a transaction. So the more transactions you complete, then what happens? Make more money. Make more commissions. So commissions <laughs> are money. So anyways, that's how we get paid. We don't get paid generally um, unless we sell you something. We've been in, I mean, it's all negotiable. So commissions are negotiable. How you process a sale is different. I've been paid monthly to take properties for sale and I've been paid at the end. So it's all, it's all negotiable, but commission is basically what we get paid. Generally, I would say it's a percentage of the sales price. But it can be a flat fee as well. It can be a flat fee. Whatever's higher. <laughs> <laughs> Common areas, the land and improvements in a condominium, planned unit development, or housing development that are owned and used collectively by all of the residents, such as parking lots, hallways, and recreational facilities available for common use. Also called common elements in a building with leased units or spaces, the areas that are available for use by all of the tenants. Yeah. Tenants or owners, so if you have um, basically a condo, you're going to have exclusive access to 
your individual unit. Sometimes you may have an individual garage or a individual parking space, but for the most part, everything else will be common space. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice. There's a collective group in having a, a common area. Usually the cost of maintaining it will be jointly taken care of as well. So instead of like having one person be individually responsible for taking care of the full yard, you have a collective group of whoever all the people have an interest in that common area, their homeowners dues or something will cover the maintenance of those common area spaces. Yeah, for a lot of people it just makes life, I guess, easier because they have less to maintain because it's done by uh, a group of people. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Cool part is, especially if you're a condo, depending on your lifestyle, but if you have a condo or an area that has a, a common space and you don't have to maintain it, nice thing is you can split from out of town for a month or two and come back and that common area is going to be maintained and in the same condition as when you leave versus if you have a single family residential house you leave and you mow your own lawn you come back and your yard's shot so there's right. a huge advantage of having part of an association take care of that for you community property property owned jointly by a married couple in washington and other community property states as distinguished from each spouse's separate property. Generally, any property acquired through the labor or skill of either spouse during marriage. So you just can't sell the house without telling your spouse. Right. And, or, and if you buy a property, even if you buy a property while you're married, half becomes the spouses as well in Washington state. So a lot of times there'll be like some deeding. So assuming that everyone's on the same, same path, but if, if two people own a property, it takes both of them to sell it. Even if one person will look at the title, but if you bought a house and then later got married, unless there's something that you're figuring out, sooner or later, your spouse is gonna become co-owner of that property and you cannot sell it with the title company and actually clear title without the spouse's interest in the property. So it's pretty cool. Washington thinks that we're grouped together. So if you've gotten married, then you're gonna be a group and your properties and assets will be combined. It'll be community property. Comparable, a recently sold and similarly situated property that is used as a point of comparison by an appraiser using the sales comparison approach. And I think brokers will use this quite a bit too on valuing a property. So for the most part, a comparable is used in determining the value of a property. So um, there's a few, there's comparable approach, there's um, replacement cost income approach, but a lot of banks and brokers put a big value on comparable approach value. So if you take the same home, say it was like the Franklin model in a new development and that same Franklin model sold two weeks ago for X bucks, there's a good indication that having such a similar home in a similar area, the value it would be similar to the other home that recently sold like that. The hard part with some of these homes, and we're in Whatcom County, we haven't had any like really huge major developers come in and put in tracks of 500 or 1,000 homes. So we get a lot of the same, you know, locations, amenities, and similar construction and square footage. So we're, we're taking a little bit more one ofs and trying to compare them. And we'll look at square footage um, is a lot based on com comparable location and square footage. Yeah, there's, you know, there's, there is a little bit more to it because you have to look at, um, at the, the comparables, even though there might be uh, houses that are right by each other, maybe one of them, you know, hasn't been painted. Maybe there's some deferred maintenance some other stuff. So it can get a little complex. Like he said, um, if it's a cookie cutter neighborhood where all the houses are the same and they're all maintained the same, it's a little bit easier. But uh, there are a lot of variables when it comes to looking at comparables that um, having an experienced agent to look at those things definitely helps you out. Condominium. Property developed for concurrent ownership where each co-owner has a separate interest in the individual unit combined with an undivided interest in the common area of the property. It's kind of like if you have a, a 10 unit apartment building, one person owns all 10 units, rents them out, and it's an apartment. You take the same 10 unit building and you deed it differently. So condos are cool because it's like air right, how they describe what you have. So you get your unit in between the walls 
So if there's 10 of you, um, each of you have 10% interest in the common areas, but you individually own your own condominium. There's some advantages and some disadvantages to a condominium ownership. Some people love it, some people not so much. I think one of the advantages for a condominium is just like, I guess it's lifestyle. So if your lifestyle is that you're not really into maintenance and taking care of the yard and dealing with a lot of entities or issues or you like to travel and you like everything to look good, a condominium is really an easy way to go. And it, in some aspects, they've put condos in actually really cool locations and then they also have cool amenity packages too. So with a condo, sometimes you might get a swimming pool or a sports court or tennis or you might have lake access or a view or be on a golf course where it's a little bit more affordable to get the amenities that you get with a condominium. So you get more amenities and you might have an easier lifestyle of home ownership. You might not have the whole lot that you have to take care of and get to have 100% control of everything all the time, but it's pretty cool if that fits your lifestyle for having a fractional ownership in a lot of the different amenities that that condominium association may have. I mean, some of the disadvantages may be if you don't like rules and like you've got a you know, Siberian Husky that weighs however much those big dogs weigh. Um, there might be rules in the association that you can't be a dog breeder <laughs> and or raise chickens. <laughs> it just, there's gonna be rules that are actually set. So some people like rules and some people don't like rules. So it's something to consider uh, if you're gonna have a condominium and we'd be happy to go over the pros and cons of that with you. Conforming loan, a loan made in accordance with the underwriting criteria of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and which therefore can be sold to those entities. The benefit for that is that um, instead of just going to your regular brick and mortar bank and then them going to the vault to give you the money, um, they're gonna run out of money. So these are basically sold as securities and the government backs them and, and uh, so then they may give you the money, but then they will sell that mortgage to the uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac and give them the local bank the money back and then they'll get a they'll get a fee for helping that too so they'll make a couple bucks on that. The loan to finance the cost of constructing a building usually providing that the loan funds will be advanced in installments as the work progress. The benefit here is that if you have raw land what are you going to do to put the home on there? There's not a lot of lenders that are going to do construction loans, um, but when you find them, they're, it's nice. But basically, the gist of it is um, you own the piece of land, and it can be the land package or construction. Um, but it's how you buy it. Did you buy the land first, or are you going to build the house and, and, um, and the lot at the same time? But essentially, you will have your permits that will specify what the house is that you're going to build, and then you're gonna have estimates for what the cost is of everything. And when you're working with your construction loan, they'll go out and say, all right, you have the foundation in and it's framed. We're gonna give you 27% of the loan. You have it, now the roof's on. We're gonna give you five more percent of that. And then the windows are in and siding. We'll give you another 10%. So double check the numbers, but it's just a percentage on how, you, how it takes to pay the whole home off. So it definitely works pretty well for uh, not having cash to pay for five hundred thousand to build a house, you can borrow with the, your down payment. So, if you're say the construction cost was um, five hundred thousand, you're putting twenty percent down. You essentially get to borrow the four hundred thousand to build the home. Constructive notice: knowledge of a fact imputed to a person by law. We kind of run into this, I, I would say, a, a bunch, um, and it's kind of gone back and forth as far as what the courts have thought, as far as uh, you know, buyer beware or, or buyer to look in things. So, for the most part, say you have an inspection, the inspection says, "Oh, you might want to research the roof." Well, and you close on it, and the next year the roof leaks. It's hard to get mad at the seller or the inspector if they said you need to look at the roof and if you don't research the roof further then it's hard to get frustrated with someone. So it is something that it is implied on that a buyer is gonna do their own due diligence before they purchase a property. 
contingencies. What are contingencies? Um, there's a few different types of contingencies in real estate transactions. Traditionally, the main contingent may reference the buyer need to sell another home. So buyer is saying, all right, Mr. Seller, I'll purchase your home, but I need to sell my property first. I am going to buy your home contingent on selling my home. That's traditionally what is a contingency. The term will also get thrown around with uh, contingencies that a buyer may want to obtain for either financing, make sure we can get a loan on it or an inspection, and those are contingencies. So a contingency is a, uh, I guess a request for a buyer to say, we're well, gonna buy it as long as something else happens or I'm satisfied with. Contract, an agreement between two or more persons to do or not to do a certain thing for consideration. And for a huge part of our job, it is, it is contracts. They're written contracts. Um, and there's a variety of them. A lot of times there's one when a home comes up for sale, there's a written contract between the property owner and a broker to list the property. And that would be the listing agreement. And that is a contract. The same thing can happen with buyers. If a buyer meets with a broker who's looking to purchase, there's a buyer agency agreement and that is a contract that's written between the two parties. And when we're out looking, when we put a buyer and a seller together and they make an agreement for the buyer to purchase the seller's home, and then that's a written contract. For the most part, I think those are the most contracts we work with. There's some with real estate, obviously dealing with rental agreements or contracts for repairs. But for the most part, it's just a, a meeting of the minds or an understanding of what's going to happen in a certain chain of events. And it's reduced to writing and signed by all parties. So I like them. Uh, I think it's good to let parties know what their expectations are. I think if there's sometimes not contracts, it's a little vague and people aren't sure what the rules are. So contracts are important. Contractor, one who contracts to perform labor or supply materials for a construction project or to do other work for a specific price. We have, you know, a specific uh, contractor list that for the most part have been vetted, um, but it's still, you still have to do your due diligence and make sure that they are licensed, bonded, insured, so that you're not liable for ha something that happens there. So you have some recourse and, and then checking their reviews and making sure it's a good fit. They may be the, the, the highest rated ones, but maybe that contractor and you don't see eye to eye. So it's like, it's an important aspect if you're gonna be hiring somebody to put carpet in your house or build a house um, to make sure you have good rapport and that it's somebody that is trustworthy to you. Sure, and, and I think it goes back with the other term we had with the contract is how is your contract? What are the expectations? Is it, you know, do you have a written contract or a verbal contract? What's the extent of the work that someone's doing? Are they coming out to say, mow the lawn one day? And it's a, it's a relatively small risk to know if it's a few hundred dollars to have someone take care of something versus we want to do a whole addition and and it's you know tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. What what's going to happen in the expectations and permitting and and uh, or just even different clauses you put in the contract that might be if you're hiring an excavator and they're digging dirt, they're going to have you know who contacts the utility company to make sure there aren't pipes there. What happens if they run into rock? Is there a rock clause if they have to chisel out rock more? Or if you're a carpenter working in the house and all of a sudden you find dry rot, well, if that's not bid, what happens? So um, working with a contractor, I would say one, have a contract for the contractor and just go in eyes wide open. I think most projects end up taking longer and costing more than most people are anticipating. So in talking with a few different people too, we'll get different ideas. It's, it's wild how vastly different contractors uh, bids can be for the similar project and just have different angles of getting there. So we're happy to kind of go over, be the voice of reason and, and get our two cents on on property improvements that you're doing it. Because we will meet with some people and, and they're like, all right, we're looking at selling our house next year. What are some of the projects you think we might want to consider? And the owners may have some of the stuff that we look at it doesn't really force or add value to the property they're just they they may have wanted to do it so if you're putting money into your real estate as an investment it does make sense to pick the items that actually increase the value the most too 
conventional loan, an institutional loan that is not insured or guaranteed by a government agency. On conventional loans, there's a ton of different types of, of programs as well, and 5, 10, 20 percent. So they're, uh, any type of loan helps our industry because it allows a buyer the opportunity to buy the real estate without having all of, all of the, the down payment money or all of the price. So if you're going to buy a house for 500000 you don't need 500000 cash. But you can get something for 5 percent down, you only need 25000 Then the bank will lend you the balance. So that's the huge benefit to our job. If it wasn't for financing, I don't know what real estate would look like because it's, it's a huge, huge benefit for helping uh, buyers and sellers. Corrective maintenance, ongoing repairs that are made to a building and its equipment in order to restore it to good operating condition. It's a stitch in time will save you nine. Right. And so not necessarily the most exciting things to put money in on, but let's just say having your furnace service. Right. Would you rather pay a tech, you know, hundred bucks a year to come in and maintain and clean it and change the filters out or skip that for a few years and then get to spend several thousand dollars on a new unit. So smart money's on maintaining what you have. It's just like changing oil in your car. You probably don't have to change the oil in your car, but you're not going to get a couple hundred thousand miles out of it. So right. same thing with real estate. If you're going to buy it, take care of it. Cost approach to value. One of the three main methods of appraisal in which the estimate of the subject property's value is arrived by estimating the cost of replacing or reproducing the improvements, then deducting the estimated accrued depreciation and adding the estimated, estimated market value of the land. The cost approach can be used to pretty much all phases of real estate, and it's, it's just basically what is the replacement cost for putting that structure together. And here in Whatcom County, I, where I at least mentally seem to use it the most is when we look at property, say if it's in the county on acreage, and then that's when my cost approach comes in. So we're like, okay, so much for a septic, so much for uh, a well, so much to get power in. And especially if you're looking like at a manufactured home, because manufactured homes actually depreciate in value, but the real estate goes up. And so when you look at like an older, manufactured home on a property, say it's 20 years old, and how much they want for this piece of property versus saying, all right, that's a lot of money. If I bought raw land and I could put in my own new well and own new septic and brand new manufactured home, what would that cost be? And just look at it, how things come together. And sometimes you can find properties that you can actually buy below cost replacement. So it's pretty wild that someone puts so much money into certain aspects of the property, you cannot duplicate it for what they're into it. So it's it's another way, the cost approach, the uh, sales comparison approach, and the income approach. So the cost approach works with all aspects, all types of property, but it may not necessarily mean to do with what the actual value is, but it's a matter of what it value cost. Credit, a payment receivable owed to you as opposed to a debit, which is a payment due owed by you. Sometimes we might do a credit to where, let's just say the uh, needs to be painted or you need new carpeting or it needs a roof or something like that. So in lieu of the property owner um, making these corrections and say it was going to be $10,000 for new carpet, they'll just say to the buyer, hey, we'll just give you $10,000 at closing and you go figure the carpet out or we'll knock $10,000 off the price and you, you take it as is. So kind of an understanding as far as how to, to get, um, to, to make the house equal for what your expectations were. Comes in a lot in real estate, really. Sometimes we might get a credit for closing costs where a buyer needs assistance on down payment or something, so the buyers are asking for a credit that way. So um, there's lots of types of credits and they do happen fairly often in real estate. Deed of trust, an instrument that creates a voluntary lien on a real property to secure the repayment of a debt and which includes a power of sale clause permitting non-judicial foreclosure. The parties are the grantor or the trustor, the borrower, the beneficiary, the lender, and the trustee, a neutral third party. So basically a loan or a mortgage. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to and it's secured by the property. So um, if you wanna borrow some money 
and buy a property, they'll let you use the property as collateral. The instrument that they use to make sure that they get repayment is the deed of trust. It's recorded against the property, so you can't sell it to someone else without that lender being notified. So it affects title. Um, you're not gonna be able to sell it without clearing that, just like if you had a car and wanted to clear title and you still owed the credit union or the bank some money on the car, it's recorded that there's still a loan on that. So it's a big part of real estate because everyone doesn't have cash. And so it's, it's important to make sure that, say a buyer puts 20% down, the bank comes up with 80%. So it's a great way to get into real estate. And you can get in for you know zero down. I'm a vet, I've gotten no money down on homes before. So you can go no money down to 25% down. So there's a lot of financing options. Some people get confused with deed and title. So this deed says a legal document formally conveys ownership of a property from seller to buyer versus title, which is a document that indicates ownership of a specific property. Sometimes I think they go back and forth because the deed is actually the piece of paper that the seller signed to the buyer. Some may call it a bill of sale or a transfer, but that's what a deed is. Deed, an instrument which, when properly executed and delivered, conveys title to the real property from the grantor to the grantee. It's kind of similar to Monopoly. You know, when you land on the oranges, I like the oranges personally. My cousin taught me about this. We'll talk Monopoly strategy later. Go orange. But when you land on it, you can buy it. There's the deed. So you now own the property. In life, it's not Monopoly, but when you buy the property, it's a deed. It's recorded in the county which in the property is located and it gives public knowledge to everybody that this is your property. There's a few different types of deeds and you'll have to call us to ask about each different types, but traditionally we're using uh, warranty deeds to, or to convey title from a seller to a buyer. Yeah, and, and simple, it's like buying a, a, like when you buy a car, you get a title that shows ownership in real estate, you get a deed and that shows your ownership. Depreciation deductions. Under the Federal Income Tax Code, deductions from a taxpayer's income to permit the cost of an asset to be recovered, allowed only for a depreciable property that is held for the production of income or used in a trade or business. Also called cost recovery deductions. Essentially, it's a tax issue and everyone treats their taxes differently. So our suggestion, which I have, Dave has, is work with an accountant that's gonna help you make sure to make the best tax decisions you can. However, in real estate, knowing enough to be dangerous and try to point you in the right direction to get that accountant is, you get to write off things on the property. So you get to depreciate the value. And that's one of the great things of real estate is that each month, if you have a mortgage and mortgages are depreciable, you get to make a payment and the and the mortgage goes down each month and you also get the value that most likely goes up each month and you get a depreciation on taxes so you kind of get to annually save on the property and so it's kind of complex it's going to depend on what the type of property is where you live and what type of work you're doing because there's there's certain items that are depreciable and either you're going to take them that year or you're going to take them over the life of the loan is, is it a capital improvement or is it a repair or maintenance item so it's kind of complicated and i'm not going to state right here that this is exactly how it is but it's it's a great idea on real estate on how to further um, your tax advantage. So it's a, it's a tax advantage play really for depreciating your real estate. Designated broker. A person who is licensed as a managing broker has a designated broker's endorsement added to their license by the DOL and serves as a designated broker for one or more firms bearing ultimate responsibility for all the firm's activities. In, in Washington state currently, which has changed, where we used to have uh, people who had a real estate license were real estate agents, that's no longer. We're all brokers now, and you're either gonna be a real estate broker, a managing broker, or the designated broker. And those are the three options we have. Once you get your real estate license, you're a real estate broker. And to get the license, you've taken your hours of clock hours and, and passed the Washington state test and you're a real estate license. 
you're a broker. The second one is after you've been in the business for a few years and you've met some goals and taken some classes and passed another test for the managing brokers test, now you're a managing broker. When you take a managing broker and the regular brokers and they work in an office, each office has one designated broker per office and that, that person oversees the entire office, it's their brokerage and they are the designated broker. Many times designated brokers, that's their main job is just being the broker of the office. They may not be out doing sales, which I like in our case, we've got a great designated broker and she's a non-competing broker. She's just work, working on a real estate um, company and not competing with us. So that's a benefit I think for us is having the, each person just have their task. And so her task is running the business and our task is making the sales. Discount. Two definitions for discount. The first is to sell a promissory note at less than its face value. Or number two, an amount withheld from the loan amount by the lender when the loan is originated, ending in discount points. The first one's fairly easy, happens quite a bit really. If someone has an owner contract, a private contract, that's actually marketable. And so say um, I owe Dave $100,000, it's secured by real estate, and Dave has a piece of paper, and I owe you Keith to Dave, and Dave would like to trade that, and he may discount it. Someone may come across, Kyle could come across and say, hey, Dave, I'll give you $80,000 for the opportunity to have the IOU from Keith for $100,000. So Dave says, sure, give me the $80,000. So Dave is out of the picture. Um, he transferred that for $80,000 cash. Kyle now got a discount because I still owe Kyle the $100,000 that he only paid $80,000 for. So his rate of return is going to be crazy. Not that it's bad. Dave probably wouldn't have fun with his eighty grand or whatever he wanted to do. So it does work. It's just a, a discount in business. The second port point being um, on a loan amount to where you may pay a discount to get a lower interest rate. So someone may offer you X interest and if you want to lower it a percentage or a half point or a quarter point, you pay a discount up front and that will lower the interest rate. So you can either take par pricing, which is like take it at the exact rate where they're at right now, or you could say, all right, for a little bit of a discount, I can get a lower payment. It costs you a little bit of money, but and it depends on how long you own it, your payment will be less because your interest rate's less. So a little complicated on that. Um, loan officers usually are the ones that are gonna help you get into that. I bounce it by us a little bit. In some areas, loan officers will make additional money on your discount, so it's making sure that you're getting treated fairly. So our clients will double check a lot of what they're doing and make sure that they're on the right path. But discounts are an important part of real estate. Distressed home. A personal residence that is in danger of foreclosure because the owner is delinquent on mortgage or tax payments. There's been distressed homes, I would probably say, since the beginning of time, where someone has the intentions of having real estate and something happens. You know, back in the olden days, they get a bad crop or they're a drought or whatever happens. There's there's been distress and there's been things in the economy or that, that moves distressed properties along as well. Recently, it's been you know mortgage rates or people don't have a job or the value of the property has gone down. So it's not uncommon to have a property that's been distressed. We haven't seen it in the most recent market with it, you know, type of hyper inflating, but in a cool down or a softer market, there's a bigger chance that people may be stuck without equity. Um, and equity may not have everything to do with it. It's more of you could lose your job. Something could happen to you and you're not able to meet your monthly financial obligations. You may be looking at foreclosure. You might be in a, a distressful uh, home situation. If you are in that situation and you think that you can see down the forecast that you might not have enough money to continue to make payments or 
you know, you have some equity and you'd rather lower your payments or just kind of move on. We have those kinds of meetings with people all the time and just try to go over what's your financial position and is there something, does it make sense to sell the house or refinance it or take some money out of it or move on? So there's a lot of different options, maybe rent it. So usually when we're going to meet with someone, the first case is we're not trying to look to sell your house. We're trying to help you problem solve to see, well, hey, if we refinance this and did a couple other things and, and took all of your other credit card debt and put it into one mortgage, then then maybe your payment's going to go down and you'll be in a better position. So we're trying to help people on the long run. And the reason we'll help you with this right now is that we know you're going to think we're great guys, which we are. And then when you actually do want to sell in five years, you're going to give us a call back. So if you're selling now, that's great. Or if it's in five years or 10 years, whatever, we'll, we'll always shoot square with you. Down payment the part of the purchase price of a property that the buyer is paying in cash. The difference between the purchase price and the financing. Could be one of our easier words of the whole definition, but whatever your down payment is. So you put down 20%, the bank puts down 80%, that equals 100%, you got a loan. I think a lot of people are scared by down payment. Maybe like more first time home people are people that aren't, aren't experienced because there, there is an idea of, I need to have X amount of dollars for a down payment. But really when you meet with lenders or meet with us and stuff, you can figure out ways to do things because there are zero down loans in, in some aspects, um, depends on, on the property. But there's also, you can get down payment assistance from a family member or uh, some other way. So a, a down payment is something that uh, I think first time home buyers are, don't really have a good idea of what it actually can be. Right. Yeah, there's some options out there. Um, yeah, and the down payment could be zero and it could be triple zero down and, and triple zero is like with the closing cost. So usually if you're going to have, say, even a 20% down and the bank lends you the 80%, you'll still have closing costs. So you'll have cost of the appraisal, title insurance, escrow, things like that. So you could probably anticipate another 3% of closing costs and what it's going to take to grease the tracks to make sure everything happens. So you're going to be set up for closing, but sometimes those can even be financed in or you can have the seller try to pay some. So there's all different types of loans. And so, but the down payment's pretty simple. It's just how much you're putting down in addition with the closing costs. So, and I think some people miss that. You need the down payment and the closing costs. I think the other thing people miss is that they try to save almost too much of a down payment up, not realizing they could have got into a home with less of a down payment if they structured it different. So someone may be trying to save their money for a year to get the down payment when realistically, we may have been able to help you a year ago, got you at a different price and maybe so you own it for a year. So it's worth giving us a shout and researching these down payment requirements for uh, purchasing a home. Duplex, a structure that contains two separate housing units with separate entrances, living areas, baths, and kitchens. So there's a variety of types of plexes. So it's basically a house where I guess it would be a one plex, so it's never been referred that way, but a plex, and then anything else. And there's an advantage to having multiple housing units on one property, and it, it helps for affordability. It also helps for investment. So usually if someone has some type of a plex, there's some type of an investment element to it. So if it's a duplex, there's two people living there. If, if, if I'm one person, then I'm gonna live in one side and rent the other side out. It may be two friends that went in and bought a duplex and each one of them lived in half. And so both halves were kind of owner occupied. If you get a triplex or a fourplex, it could be a tenplex. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's just a term, the term plex is for housing units, multiple housing units on one lot and there's a mostly just 100 percent advantage to having right. a plex property because it's going to be more affordable for more affordable to rent a plex type or an apartment unit than it is the full house you're not going to have necessarily the maintenance issues if you're renting it if you're the owner and let's just say you had a duplex it's easier to have a landscaper come over and take care of two rental streams on one property versus two separate houses. So it's, you're kind of collapsing things. And say you had a sixplex, well, instead of having six places around town to go collect rent, you're only going to one spot. So 
kind of one-stop shopping. Yeah, I think dupl duplexes have been really popular. I've seen in the last couple of years, people call it house hacking or whatever, because for a first time home buyer, maybe they can get in um, to a duplex and offset their mortgage payment by renting out the other half. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's it's been popular in the last couple of years. And it's easier if you're a first time investor getting a duplex, um, you're getting two for the price of one kind of in some situations it's easier maintenance because you have both the properties there so yeah i think duplexes there's definitely a big advantage um, some people like side by side because then you don't have the stack or garage but they they come in all site types and varieties for investment uh, some people like certain things they don't like the hot water tank upstairs whatever but i think going with any type of uh Plex or or more people living on the same piece of properties is kind of a sign of the times.